The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen only mode. Um, next slide. So we know that losing weight is more complicated than calories in versus calories out. So we know and we know that there are many different fact factors that come into play when an individual is trying to be healthier. We know that there are strong ties between food and culture that make dietary changes difficult. And we know that not everyone has access to parks and fitness centers that there are language barriers, barriers of childcare, and we all face the constraints of time and money, um, some more than others. Next slide. We also know that zip code is the greatest predictor of health outcomes, that where you live impacts your ability to purchase fresh fruits and vegetables, that the em built environment impacts access to healthcare, um, and also neighborhood safety, whether or not you feel comfortable being in your neighborhood and going for a walk or for a run. Um, and there's also different proximities to environmental toxins. And we know that low income communities are disproportionately affected by this. Uh, next slide. Um, and we also know that healthcare really only treats about 20% of our overall health and wellness as individuals. And this is something that uh, Jerome Adams, the current Surgeon General, touched on during his keynote address at the Healthier Texas Summit last month. Um, next slide. So my point in talking about this isn't to be depressing, but rather to emphasize that when it comes to improving the health of Texans, there really isn't a simple solution. Um, but there is some good news. Um, it's not all doom and gloom. Um, we have learned that community health collaboratives are one way in which we can start addressing these issues. Uh, next slide. Um, so improving health is an issue that crosses sectors. And collaboratives that have representation from various sectors are well situated to be a problem solver within their communities. Next slide. Um, particularly as they engage stakeholders from a variety of sectors. Um, this includes government, employers, nonprofits, faith based community, um, schools, and community members at large. And as these collaboratives engage stakeholders from a variety of sectors, they can help decrease health disparities and increase the efficient use of services and resources. Next slide. And I want to be clear. So when I talk about collaboratives, I also am including coalitions, partnerships, councils. Um, there are a lot of different names that are used to describe similar organizations. And we want to be broadly inclusive of all of them. Uh, next slide. So we know that collaboratives have this great potential, but I'm sure um, all of you, as have I, have been involved in coalitions that have felt like a waste of time because it's all talk, 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 and no action, and nothing gets done, and you sit in these meetings, and what's the point? Uh, so one of the things that I've really been focused on this year is better understanding what makes the collaboratives effective. Um, and I'd like to share a little bit about what I've learned in this regard. Uh, next slide. One of the things that I've learned is that the qualities of the collaboratives leader matter and that collaboratives really benefit from a leader who inspires trust both in the individuals who sit on the collaborative and the member organizations, and a leader who instills confidence in the ability of the group to get things done, who is inclusive and transparent and neutral. And when I say neutral, what I mean is that they are there as a facilitator to help the group reach their goals and not there to push their own agenda. Next slide. The cohesion of the group is important. And cohesion refers to this common understanding that members of the collaborative have of the issue and that you, they're united around a shared passion and a common goal. That there's this feeling of mutual trust and respect among individual members of the collaborative as well as member organizations. 
and that the collaborative is goal directed, that there's this common goal which directs the movement and the actions of the group. Next slide. Uh, collaboratives also benefit from a well-defined organizational structure uh, with clearly defined roles and responsibilities to ensure that everyone stays engaged in the process and that no one is left on the sidelines wondering what they should be doing and what is going on and what comes next. And also that they use this organizational structure to engage decision makers within the community. Um, the people who get things done. And this can be leaders in specific roles within the community, um, or it can also be community members who don't have an official title or role, but do have the influence within the community to build that buy-in from the ground up. Um, next slide. So those are some of the main traits that I wanted to touch on. Um, a few of the others that I wanted to mention briefly are experience collaborating, that members of the collaborative have either have worked on a collaborative before, and it's okay if that's not the case. It just means that it may take a little bit more time for the group um, to hit their stride and start seeing that impact. Uh, flexibility, that the organizations at, that are part of the collaborative are willing and able to compromise and they're open to complementary opportunities that arise um, as they're working towards their common goal, that they have sufficient resources. And while yes, financial resources and staff and funding are important, they're not the only resources that matter. It could be that one member of the collaborative has access to a conference room or a conference line or web conferencing software that they're able to use to support the group. So it's recognizing and utilizing the resources that are available. And then frequent communication. And with communication, it's not just about the frequency, but also about the quality and making sure that the communication is action oriented and directed towards helping the group meet their goals. Um, so that is just, a brief overview of some of the key traits that are important um, in collaboratives. And at this point, I'd like to go ahead and turn the time over to Jennifer Kofer, um, who will be speaking about some of her experience working with collaboratives. Thank you, Ashley. Um, you set a great table for some of the examples that I'm going to talk about. Um, I think you did some great uh, findings there in my 18 years of working within collaboratives and coalitions. And I appreciate you explaining that people use different words and different terms, but it's really a group of people coming together to accomplish a goal. Um, and it looks different in different settings and different scopes of work and different limbs. So I hope you guys can, can see um, some of the main talking points we have. And if you wanna move forward, um, the next slide set into to my introduction. Um, we are, I am located here in Houston, Texas at MD Anderson Cancer Center. We're a part of the University of Texas system. And with MD Anderson, um, the next slide will describe uh, the place in which I sit in this large institution is the cancer prevention and control platform. And our primary objective here is just to accelerate development, dissemination, amplification of evidence-based strategies, community services, policy interventions, and knowledge targeting measurable reductions in cancer incidence and mortality at a population level. So all of our work to do this in the cancer prevention and control platform comes through collaboratives. So it makes a lot of sense that um, we are a part of your learning community here, um, but we also bring a lot of expertise in convening individuals. And on the next slide, you'll see um, the program in which I get to be a part of is called In Tobacco um, with the 18 years of experience in tobacco control and in public health, um, MD Anderson decided to invest in a program and interventions and services that would end tobacco related cancers. So that's the goal um, of our program, as well as under the banner of in tobacco at MD Anderson, we do a lot of other um, items as you see here, but I wanna focus on the collaborative um, part of our work. And so moving forward, I'll just talk about the overview of my 
a view on essentials for collaboration, and I call them the four Ps. Um, I'll give examples from past experience where I worked at the American Lung Association and had the opportunity to work on the Smoke Free New Orleans campaign, uh, one of the most beneficial campaigns um, in the South that really um, is changing behavior and changing the landscape of culture in a, in a large city. Um, we also, um, just this past year, worked in Fort Worth, Texas, as well as in San Antonio on two different strong tobacco control policies. And I have an asterisk there because, yes, MD Anderson is a state institution, so we do not engage in lobbying. But uh, with the expertise that I draw upon and the skills that um, I operate within a collaborative, we were able to serve as a resource and a coalition convener um, and support in many of the ways Ashley described as um, facilitating making sure frequent communication happened and so i'll describe our role there um, and then again i have a slide in there about how to do partnerships on a budget um, and hopefully we'll be able to get to that so transitioning into the first um, p here or the list of the four p's people process product and purpose i am a preacher's kid so i'm all about having three or four points and so we will dive right into people in the next slide people within a coalition or collaborative so again, I come and draw upon a lot of tobacco control experience, um, and many of you on the on the webinar may not have that lens. So I just want you to focus on your lens and take some of these gems and, and ideas and apply it to the work which you're doing. But I do have to say we have a lot to learn from tobacco. It's been one of the greatest uh, public health movements in the past 20 years, um, and one of the greatest and largest epidemics still going on, killing the most people um, in our nation and in our state. Um, but we don't do everything right, but we do do a lot right. So I just want to make that disclaimer that that's my lens I draw upon and I hope this is helpful for you. And so I describe people within an organization or in a coalition because you need them. You need the people to operate and people are going to come to you with either an interest professionally because of who they're employed by or either personally because they are interested. So when I speak about organizations and partners, you're going to have your traditional supportive voices. And so, for example, in tobacco control, um, we have the Cancer Society, the Heart Association, Tobacco Free Kids, the Lung Association, Americans for Non-Smokers Rights, major health systems and state health departments. And in mental health, I didn't finish my thought last night here, but um, we're starting to work in the behavioral health and mental health community within tobacco uh, cessation. And I've learned there are many different partners um, at the table that have done this work for years. Um, and they are the traditional voices, whether it's the local mental health authorities, the behavioral health community, the counseling community. Um, so just think about from your lens right now, and if you're taking notes, go ahead and write down those traditional supportive voices that are probably already in your coalition and collaborative. But I always make the disclaimer of don't forget the importance of the non-traditional voices. Your, your partners you need to engage that are going to influence folks um, and they may not be able to advocate, but they can lend expertise and strong expertise or resources or support. Um, I'm going to give some examples from Fort Worth, again, in New Orleans and San Antonio Tobacco 21. But we found that chambers of commerce do care about health issues. When businesses are, are looking to locate, um, I'll use Amazon as an example, as they chose Crystal City, Virginia and, and part of uh, either Long Island or Brooklyn. I can't remember which part of New York which borough, but they looked at health indicators and health outcome. They looked at public infrastructure. They looked at all, all types of the city and the community to relocate businesses. That happens every single day. So your chambers of commerce um, are a network of businesses and they're very, very um, engaged in some health initiatives across our state of Texas and in, in your local community. Um, so those are non-traditional voices. They may not can attend every one of your meetings, but they do lend a voice. They do lend um, notoriety, expertise, and influence. Military and veterans groups are very active, um, and they may be a non-traditional group to consider engaging in your, your issue. Uh, I'm a part of the University of Texas system, and our university system is very influential. Um, and within the university system, you have researchers, scientists, uh, behavioral health folks. Uh, you may have groups that focus on disparities or equity. Um, and, and that's a strength to draw upon from your community. So you might have a community college system in your local area. You should engage them. Um, they are a strong part of the community um, as far as education, as far as an economic driver with employment. Um, so you can consider them a non-traditional voice uh, and invite them to be a part of your, uh, your conversation, your collaborative. 
And on the next slide, I'll describe individuals. Um, and these are the most important people because they are usually the survivors or the storytellers or the subject matter experts. They look very different, but you need them. So they may not be attached to a certain organization, but they've been impacted by your issue. And so you can categorize them as the individual within your coalition. Um, storytellers are those that uh, tell the best uh, stories of either surviving or thriving through an issue or whatever it is, but you want those folks that can tell the story of what you're trying to accomplish. The subject matter experts are, are our bread and butter here within the tobacco control community or within the cancer prevention community, because you need those folks that know the evidence or the latest research. You need the subject matter experts to validate what you're working on. And you have to make sure that they all mesh together and then you're gonna have those passionate advocates. If you go to any city council meeting, there's always that one community member that attends every city council meeting or every board meeting. Um, those passionate advocates can be your asset if you engage them on some of these issues you're working on. But my reminder here is to not to forget to equip, train and prepare them um, and give them opportunities to stay engaged. Some of the biggest faults of coalitions and co collaboratives can not um, can happen because we don't continue to bring them new information or add a media training onto that coalition meeting because that's new and fresh or good reminders. Um, share the latest and greatest research with them and make it digestible for the individual. Um, if you're going to have them speak um, in front of a group or uh, to a city council or to a legislative committee, prepare them. Don't take that for granted that they just know how to do that. But that's our job as conveners and co collaborative uh, folks to make sure that we equip, train, and prepare those individuals. And then last part of within a coalition, you have your organizations, traditional and non-traditional, you have your individuals. Now I truly believe that when they sign a commitment form, um, they are all in. And this looks different in different settings. So whether it's a letter of support by the organization signed by the highest decision maker, or um, it is an individual saying, I agree to do this. Within that commitment form and support form, you can include details to gauge their level of interest. So whether they would just offer their logo and say, yes, we know this offers influence and here's our letter of support, or hey, I wanna attend every meeting, I'll host the meeting, I'll provide refreshments at your meeting, um, we'll lend five individuals to go and speak and support you at your meeting. Whatever it is with your coalition collaborative you want, include that in your support form when you engage folks and have them check a box that they are willing to do it. And then ask specifically about public or private support. In the 18 years of, of my career, I found a lot of um, individuals and groups, um, politically speaking, may not want to have public support, but they're gonna have private support. And if, if you're working on a policy per se, um, that's very important. And I'll refer to this during the New Orleans campaign because there was a group that was privately supportive and talked to a lot of the decision makers who who voted on our policy at the time, um, and they didn't need to have their logo out there. They had enough influence behind the scenes and impacted enough people where they just made a few phone calls and said they supported our issue behind the scenes. And so I, I give you that information so that you can use your discernment there when you have some influencers who may not want to sign your letter of support or, or do a commitment form, but they're willing to make a few phone calls behind the scenes. Sometimes that's most important within your collaborative or to accomplish a goal. Um, so I'll transition now to the next P, which is process. I am um, a true believer in process, whether it's meetings, calls, public events, organizing, or just whatever it is with communication, as Ashley talked about, with effective and quality communication. The process matters, whether it's your small group, whether it's your team, um, but I truly believe you can organize folks within their individual strengths by their positions, um, their capacity, or the lane in which they operate. But the communication is key within the small groups. And frequently, as I'll describe on the next slide, um, that's going to be important too. But I have some uh, process examples. What does that actually look like? So if you're a coalition or a collaborative working on a policy, you're gonna to wanna to organize a smaller group based on those that are actually your advocates or your lobbyists. These are the individuals who communicate with elected officials and policymakers, maybe the city attorney's office. Uh, they may not be the actual lobbyists, but they may have the advocacy experience or do grassroots work. Um, these are usually your people that may need to count the votes and decide which are the calls to action. And if you're working on a uh, coalition that is working on a policy, 
not everyone needs to be in these conversations. Um, so I really like to keep these groups uh, really focused on the ones who are doing the work as described here. Your bigger coalition can get the high level information, but they do not need to get in the weeds on policy nuances and details and uh, vote counts. And in fact, those who are state employees and federal employees or city employees, county employees, don't need to be involved in these conversations uh, just to make sure they stay in their lane. The next group I'll refer to are the communications and media team. This may include social media, this may include PR and marketing, um, but your communications and media team, they're experts and you need to draw upon those expertise that they have. And we are bringing them in in the current Texas 21 coalition uh, because they're gonna enhance our stakeholder meetings, sending out media advisories, sending out um, press releases. They're gonna also train our uh, youth and young adults before they go and speak in front of legislative committees. So our communications and media team um, from each of these individuals, uh, we have a separate call just for the comms and media folks because they can speak each other's language. They get straight to the point, what do we need? What's being pushed out on Facebook and Twitter this week? Um, you know, and support each other's work. So I truly believe that's a really strong team. And so draw upon your colleagues in the communications and media lane. Um, with any functioning coalition and collaborative, you've got to have the final decision makers. People can get hung up in different opinions and, and strategies, but you have to have the final decision makers. And sometimes it's the funders. Sometimes it's um, the, the advocates who are also part of the steering committee, or sometimes it's the backbone organization. If you look at the collective impact uh, structure, they have a backbone organization. So the steering committee can be a core leadership group. Again, not everyone is a part of that. And the last one, if you'll go back one more slide, um, we talk about the full coalition and you do wanna make sure you have a gathering of the full membership. Those are your individuals, your organizations, traditional and non-traditional, your storytellers, your passionate advocates. Um, and you wanna make sure you convene them at least once a quarter, keep them engaged, give them opportunities to do something. But in the meantime, you have these small group uh, committee meetings or phone calls to keep the word going. But with that coalition, they're gonna help spread the word. They're gonna utilize the advocacy's calls to action or turn out people for this event or come and support us in this way. So the coalition is always important to gather. Um, and then we'll go to the next slide with uh, process and communication. Um, it's important within teams uh, to make sure you know how you're gonna decide to make decisions. The best way to do this, the best way to agree upon if it's policy language or language for a press release or language for a fact sheet or a one pager. And what's the timing and what are your strategies um, to, to outreach to people with, maybe it's deal breakers for policy language that you need to know when you're gonna walk away or not be a part of. Um, you know, this can be sometimes controversial, but having a process in place in which to approve and communicate about these things are very important. Um, I'm a true believer in having conference calls on your calendar. You can cancel them at any time, but having them be reoccurring um, on your calendar is a helpful way to effectively communicate. And then, of course, the good old fashioned convene in person through coalition and stakeholder meetings. All right, so there's the process and the people. And I always like to use this next picture to talk about how to stay in your lane um, because everyone has a direction in which they're going, but it's also a two way street. Um, but also know that again, staying in your lane um, keeps a little bit of the chaos at bay. If we didn't have dotted lines here, uh, we would have a crazy highway. So there's really important, I see a lot of collaborations and co coalitions that ask for help whenever I learn about their process and it's not very clear or a person's strength is not being utilized and they're being asked to do something else that they're not really interested in. Um, but staying in their lane and focusing on the end goal is always um, a good visual to learn here and, and it applies to coalitions and collaboratives. So for the, for the next 10 minutes, I wanna talk about the who, what, when, where for these examples in New Orleans, Fort Worth and San Antonio. This is the slide that's next that's gonna describe um, these three cities and going forward, uh, the next slide is also my specifics for the coalition partners in New Orleans. I know many of you from Texas, so sorry, I'm having to draw upon our sister state next door, but uh, this was a huge win for the public health community and the tobacco control community when this happened in 2015. Uh, the work started many years before from the traditional partners here on the left that were Louisiana based um, that are in the print color of orange. On the left, the national partners um, in the blue 
Um, these two groups had to learn how to work together. I'm being very transparent when I tell you that local uh, leads the way, local knows the local politics, local organizations as the ones listed on the right are gonna be there after the policy is implemented and stay on the ground, be in touch with um, the city council and the community and, and the ones that the policy impacts. So you have to have your local organizations uh, really a part of the process. And not that uh, Cancer, Heart, Lung, TFK, and ANR left New Orleans, but they are not in the day-to-day -day there in New Orleans. Some are in Baton Rouge, some are based out of DC or regional. Um, so it was important that we learned how to communicate, that we had processes in place as we worked on this very important policy together. And so we established ground rules very quickly. We established uh, communications very quickly when this campaign took legs. Um, and it made our process uh, so much fun and much easier to, to make decisions, move forward, and keep uh, the community engaged. So I'll give you an example of what that looked like. One of the hardest decisions was, on the next slide, you'll see there were two brands. We had um, a brand that uh, was black, white, and blue, and it was their tagline of healthier air for all, and the hashtag was smoke free NOLA. Healthier air for all was a campaign that existed before the advocacy group came in and said, hey, we need, um, that's funded through some state dollars. We need to make sure we're very clear in our different campaigns. So why don't we create a new advocacy logo? And so there's where the smoke free NOLA with the trumpet came in. And we had our calls to action on a separate um, logo type feel, but they blended together nicely. We wanted to make sure, again, we stayed in our own lanes, that the local groups that were funded through the state dollars or through the tax dollars or local dollars had their campaign, which we all respected, but the advocates came in, again, with the calls to action of showing up at the city council, um, showing up at a town hall, um, and then we made some other graphics. So we blended two campaigns together, and then even the national organizations like Tobacco Free Kids put out their own ads and paid media and use the same hashtag. So that was one of the hard decisions we had to work through process wise and we communicated, made effective decisions and moved forward. Um, in the next slide, you'll see that we had to decide who was gonna be message, messengers for the messages. So on the left here, these are traditional smoke-free messages, but in New Orleans, you have gaming communities, you have 517 bars, musicians and entertainers were the biggest um, folks being impacted by a smoke-free campaign. Um, and we knew that tourism and conventions were important to the city of New Orleans. We knew we had these messages and we had the evidence and the public health business uh, decision to go smoke-free, but we needed the right messengers. So we decided, um, if you can click one more time, you can see the messengers here for each message. So the traditional health-related messages were the healthcare providers. So Ochsner Health System is the largest employer in the state of Louisiana and present in New Orleans. We had them on board, as well as LSU Health Science Center, Tulane, et cetera. With economic and business, we decided to engage the chamber and we did some research and economy um, work to make sure that we could tell the return on investment for going smoke free would not hurt business. And in businesses, the next one, we had business owners that came forward and said, you know what, I've gone smoke free voluntarily and it works and here's my story. So we had business owners that joined us. And the gaming community is very tricky. That's a whole nother webinar. Um, but we wanted to make sure that we could represent the casino employees and any patrons that wanted to go to smoke free casinos. Um, we did have a few uh, casino employees come forward, some through anonymous uh, reporting tools to tell their story. Um, but we also tried to engage the bars in the bar community. And that was very interesting in New Orleans, like I said, with 517 bars. But we found a couple of bar managers and bar owners who were willing to, to be a part of our coalition as individuals and speak on behalf of themselves or either as their business. Um, and with musicians and entertainers, they were our greatest assets of our campaign. And so the next slide will show that we had musicians, we had comedians, um, some of their faces you've seen through, if you know the New Orleans campaign. Um, but I have to say, here's a key for you, so write this down. You want to make the assets of your, your community part of your campaign. So what makes your community unique? What makes your state unique? What's it known for? In New Orleans, it was known for musicians and entertainment. So we knew we needed them a part of our campaign or our coalition and our collaborative, and they were our voice. They were the spokespersons, they were the face. And so I would just really urge you to think about what's the assets in your community and make them a part of your group. 
And last, with the economic drivers, um, it was important that within the smoke free campaign, we had smoke free convention list to show decision makers like the convention center or like the tourism bureau that there are thousands of conventions that won't come to your city if you're not smoke free. And so ANR and AHA had those lists and um, therefore that was one of the, the biggest influencers. So I give you this example in New Orleans because that was a coalition of collaborative, but I'm hoping you have some takeaways and some gems and some thoughts here for you as you work on either a policy or a goal. Um, who your messenger is and who your message is is very important. And going to Fort Worth, I wanna use a local example. Just last year, we were very close to a vote and the vote actually happened in December of last year with implementation in March this year. And here are your traditional partners who work on smoke-free policies. Um, and as of course, as I mentioned with MD Anderson, we were a resource partner. We helped convene the coalition meetings. We helped plan the agendas. We helped uh, community events. And so the next slide will show you the key business supporters that we had to work with um, at the local level, which was fantastic. We grew our list in a matter of a year to recruit all of these local individuals. But I need to point out that there were two uh, non-traditional partners that really helped us with the influencing of the decision makers. Uh, Blue Zones project, uh, which is now part of Share Care nationally, but the Blue Zones in Fort Worth were a huge driver of making some healthy change for the city of Fort Worth. They were very connected to the mayor. It was a great project she loved, um, talking about built environments, um, trails, rails to trails, biking, um, uh, table food, you know, food procurement to um, farm to table places to eat. Fort Worth has a just a great um, feel, but Blue Zones was very important. And it was very strategic to align with them and ask, you know, will you sign on to this project and will you help us carry the message to the to the mayor? and about being a smoke-free city and how that's a key component of a healthy community. Um, and they did that in, their, in the way that they did um, their work. We also were told that the influencers and decision makers um, were always wanting to hear from economic development groups in the city of Fort Worth. So we had to engage a couple of the economic development groups um, and some of them were neighborhood associations, some of them were districts um, and we really did a lot of outreach to those neighborhood and economic development groups and they signed on. The Chambers of Commerce, uh, very important in Fort Worth, both the Black uh, Chamber of Commerce, the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, as well as the Fort Worth Chamber of Commerce and all three ended up signing on in support in Fort Worth. But ultimately it was those non-traditional partners of Blue Zones and Chambers that influenced the decision makers and going smoke free and making that vote happen in December of last year. And with implementation happening in March, we've heard nothing but great things out of Fort Worth. Um, having smoke free bars and smoke free bingo halls and now their whole city is smoke free. It's been a fantastic uh, work. And as you see, it's the power of a coalition and a collaborative to work in the community, to work with partners, traditional and non-traditional, but also to make sure you hear from the decision makers and know who influences them. Uh, but ultimately doing it for the greater good of, this, of the state of Texas and the city of Fort Worth. Fort Worth was the last city that didn't go smoke free until this past year. Uh, the next picture is the night of our vote and you can see uh, the power of our coalition turned out the night of the vote. And if you've ever tried to turn out people more than once, it's very hard. And so this was um, one of our favorite moments that we got to capture the diversity of our coalition, the inclusivity of our coalition. We had youth and young adults, bar owners, bar managers, the advocates. Um, we have TCU there as well as Moncrief Cancer Institute, Blue Zones, Texas Health Resources, you name it, um, UT Southwestern. It was a great turnout. Um, very happy for us. Uh, I'm glad we got to snap that shot on boat day. So um, that's a good win. Now we'll switch to San Antonio. And the next slide shows the power of this collaborative and coalition. And I wanted you to see here the difference in how we draw upon um, different avenues here in San Antonio. And our, we wanted to have a broad coalition that wasn't just health, but we brought in the Council on Alcohol and Drug Awareness. Uh, Cicada was a huge partner in San Antonio. The traditional partners of lung and uh, cancer and heart, tobacco-free kids, but you'll see, you see Blue Cross Blue Shield, San Antonio Chamber, Humana, the Health Collaborative, uh, March of Dimes, Alamo College, um, another community coalition, UTSA, UT Health San Antonio, Bethel Prevention Coalition, the Food Bank, a Child Guidance Center, and East Point Promise Prevention Coalition, 
Um, all of these individuals in the medical society, we made up the collaborative of the San Antonio Tobacco 21 Coalition. The next slide will show you some of the key takeaways um, that made our, our, our success in four months happen. Um, and again, MD Anderson served as a convener, so we helped plan stakeholder meetings and town halls, organize some structure to decision making, but ultimately we had to have the right individuals be the face of the campaign. So when you're talking about raising the age of sale of tobacco products to 21 years old instead of 18, you want to have those that are impacted, and that was the 18, 19, and 20 year olds. So youth and young adults were the face of the campaign, and you can see um, this young lady right here was the, the speaker for a press conference. Um, Dr. Bridger, the health director in um, San Antonio, was also a speaker. And the gentleman to her left is Brian Hayden, um, a, a survivor of um, many different ailments from a tobacco-related disease, but also a veteran. And he spoke about, um, yes, being out at war and being addicted to tobacco and how he started at a young age and wish he never had started. Um, so we had the voice of traditional and non-traditional partners. You see the white coats in the healthcare system, but the youth and young adults were the best um, face to this, this coalition and this campaign. And also the Chamber of Commerce came out. Um, he was personally impacted, the, the chamber representative, because his father died of lung cancer, started at smoking at the age of 12 or 13. So the take home lesson from you, if you don't work in the, in the realm of tobacco every day like I do, you know, whatever your issue is, find those um, who are surviving from that issue and be a part of your coalition. They can tell a story about the impact of the issue, whether it's diabetes, asthma, health disparities, health systems, um, school health, you know, find those passionate people and help them be a part of your collaborative. Give them something to do. Show up at a press conference, speak to a committee. Um, but Again, in San Antonio, it was a great example of how we had um, all of the people that were gonna be impacted be a part of our coalition. In the next slide, we'll talk about how we, um, well, the, I think this is the vote night. We also had a great successful vote in January and the policy was implemented in October. This was the San Antonio Tobacco 21 Coalition on vote day. Um, so we're really excited. This was the first city in, San, in Texas to raise the age and the state legislature will consider the same policy during the 2019 session. But you can see the faces here, uh, diversity, young, older, military, um, physicians. I see, um, you know, we had a couple of just business owners who cared about the city uh, to prevention folks and it was a, a great turnout. So this is San Antonio's story. I could go on and on. But I have uh, just a couple more slides for you as we uh, wrap it up in the next few minutes and leave time for question and answer. The next slide is my reminder to focus on your purpose. Whatever the purpose is of your coalition and collaborative, whether it's helping youth and young adults live healthy lives, whether it's bar workers keeping them exposed to secondhand smoke or advocating for minim higher minimum or living wage, uh, whether it's like we did in, in New Orleans with musicians and entertainers, or fighting for you know equal rights whatever your issue is that made you join this today remember your purpose because in the in the weeds when you're tied up with process and decisions and approvals um, remember why you're doing your work whether it's the kids you're fighting for whether it's um, folks that don't have a voice that can't really fight for themselves you're advocating for them um, remember that's who your purpose is and then finally if you are one that really likes um, um, structure, you could do a quick Google search for collective impact. The next slide talks about how collective impact and some structure is a little bit better than doing it by yourself on your on your own isolated. So here's a quick comparison of when we work together as a collective group, you can have a greater impact on social change, public health change at a larger scale um, with your essential partners and you will ultimately have a lot of lessons learned, a lot of action and a lot of progress. And so just wanted to leave you with that slide as we wrap up the next slide um, and some other take home messages for collective impact and how they're organized and structured with a common agenda, um, shared goals and data measurement, making sure you're doing the right activities, uh, communicating often and make sure that backbone organization um, has sustainability. And so I'll end there in the next slide with my email and our website, um, but happy to answer questions at the end and turn it back over to Ashley. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, I feel like you've just really emphasized the power 
that collaboratives have within their communities um, to accomplish amazing work. Um, so I wanted to conclude today um, just by sharing some information about resources that we've been working on at It's Time Texas uh, to support collaboratives in the state. Um, you can go to the next slide um, and to the next one. Um, so as I mentioned when I first introduced myself, I work with the Build Healthier program at It's Time Texas. Um, and the purpose of this program is to provide support to collaboratives. Um, and so we recently launched a new website, which is ittbuildhealthier.org, and that connects collaboratives to online resources in an effort to help them become more established within their community. Um, and it talks about a framework for developing a collaborative as well as a timeline for what to expect and when getting started and seeking to see that impact. You can go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, and as part of this, next April, we'll be launching the Community Lab using the Project ECHO model. Um, and for those of you who aren't familiar with Project ECHO, it's a case-based distance learning model that has been used in the medical field uh, to train primary care physicians to treat complex illnesses that would typically require specialty care. And they do this under the supervision of specialists who are training them from afar. Um, so we want to take this model and apply it to community health collaboratives. So the Community Lab ECHO will bring representatives from collaboratives across the state together via web conferencing software and enable us to share successes and troubleshoot challenges um, together as a group. So really it's creating a space for collaboratives to collaborate with one another. Let me go to the next slide. Um, so we will be bringing on our own team of specialists. So Jennifer Kofer, who you've just heard from, um, will be joining us from MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. And Matt Guy um, will be joining us from Accelerated Transformation Associates in Pueblo, Colorado. Um, and they both just have this wealth of experience, you've, you know, as you've heard from Jennifer today. Um, and then Matt also brings with him just a vast array of experience from working with collaboratives in Colorado. Um, so we're really excited and we view this as an opportunity to help collaboratives maximize their impact and really remove the need to keep reinventing the wheel. I feel like there's a lot of really great work going on in the groups that already exist in the state. Um, and so this will be an opportunity to share those experiences. I'm going to go to the next slide. Um, so we are currently in the process of recruiting participants. Uh, so if you would like to learn more, you can reach out to me. You can also visit the website. Um, and that is all I have for you today. So I think at this time, I pass the time back over to Kate. Thank you, Ashley. And thank you, Jennifer, for that great presentation. Um, we can go ahead and take some time for questions now. So just as a reminder, type your questions um, directly into that question box. Um, and as we wait for some questions to roll in, Ashley and Jennifer, do you have anything else that you'd like to touch on? Well, as we're waiting for questions, I'll ask Ashley, you may may or may not have this off the top of your head, but yeah. ago, since um, I'm involved in a couple of others, mm -hmm. a set curriculum and a set time and day. Will yours be occurring once a month, once a week, um, or as needed? What do you think the structure would be like um, for your Project ECHO? Yeah, so we right now are looking at a schedule of meeting once a month um, because we know that collaboratives tend to be volunteer or made up of volunteers who have full-time jobs and part of their responsibility could be working on the collaborative or they could be there as a volunteer. Um, we're looking at a once a month schedule. Um, we haven't quite decided the time and day yet as we want to get input from those participating. Um, and we're looking at meeting for about an hour each month at that specific time and day. Jennifer, we have a question that's asking what the remaining two P's are besides people and process. Um, so that's funny. Yes. Purpose was the last P. Product is the, th 
the third P, but product could also be policy. <laughs> so people process products. So whether your product is you're writing a state plan or you're working on um, a toolkit or your product is a tool that's going to be an app for healthier action. Whatever your product is, that's your fourth P, third P, but your purpose is your fourth P. So great question um, that the policy was what I, I included as my third P here, those policies I was working on. Little P and big P policies. Great. And then we have another question that's asking if you have any examples of how coalitions measure success. Oh my, yes. Um, and I don't want to take away from Ashley, but um, there are several different uh, measurement tools out there. Just depends usually on your funder. So whether it's a CDC fund or NIH fund or um, federal government SAMHSA fund, whatever the funding source is, State Department of Health funding, they'll put measures of success in there, whether it's attendance, engagement, actions taken. Um, you can do qualitative surveys through, you know, Survey Monkey. I'm forgetting to mention one of the best collaboratives I'm a part of at Cancer Alliance of Texas. Um, we do surveys quarterly and they do qualitative and quantitative survey um, evaluation as well as um, attendance. And uh, we also measure by our state plan and the cancer plan in Texas to make sure we're hitting our goals. So it looks different based on your um, your your topic, in my opinion, um, but there are some check boxes. I'm happy to share that offline with whoever asked the question. Feel free to email me. Thank you. And if anybody has any other questions, feel free to type those in or you can reach out to Ashley Hearn. Her email is on the screen right now or um, Jennifer Kofer. Okay, it looks like we are wrapping up a little early, which I know everyone appreciates getting a couple minutes back in their hour. So thank you for attending today's webinar. We appreciate you being here. Uh, this webinar will be archived on our website with the presentation slides. So if you missed something or need to find an email address, you can find that later today on msdcenter.org. Thanks again for joining us today and we'll see you next time.